This lecture is part of a series on rings and modules and will be about the relation between limits and exactness of sequences of modules. So the previous lecture um, we discussed the relation between co-limits and exactness and this lecture is a sort of um, continuation of the previous lecture. If you missed the previous lecture I'll try and put a link to it in that funny little white circle thing that should be floating around somewhere. So the problem we want to discuss is the following. Suppose I've got um, some sequences of modules. So the A's, B's and C's are going to be modules over some ring and I is in some index category and we're going to take limits over I in a way that I'll um, give some examples of in a moment. And the question we want to ask is, um, is the following sequence, if we take the limits of these, is this exact? And we saw in the previous lecture that this bit of it here is always exact. And the problem is um, whether whether this bit here is exact. In other words, whether the limit of the bi maps onto the limit of the ci. Um, for most of the time, the answer you get is similar to the case of co-limits, but there's one important case where the answer is quite different. So we'll start by going through the easy cases. So the first sort of limit is just a product of rings. So, so we want to know is the product of the bi does the product of the bi map onto the product of the ci? And the answer is obviously yes, if the, each bi maps onto each ci, um, provided you use some version of the axiom of choice. If, if, if you want to use weird models of set theory where the axiom of choice fails, then you probably have to think harder about this, but um, I'm not going to worry about that now. The next sort of limit is a pullback. So a product, we just take a sort of discrete category as our category i. For a pullback, our category i is this category here. And the pullback is a product of these two things, or rather the subset of the product of things with the same image here. And here, pullbacks do not preserve limits. So here's an example. Let's take the sequence 0 goes to 0 goes to m goes to m goes to 0. And what is m? Well, I don't care what m is, it's just some module as long as it's non-zero. So let's take another sequence and a third one. And I'm going to map these to each other. Um, in the middle I'm going to use the identity map. And now let's work out what the limits of um, these are, in other words, the pullbacks. Well, here I get zero, here I get zero times zero modulo something, which is just going to be zero. And here I get, well, it's going to be the diagonal elements of m times m, which is just a copy of m. And here I'm going to get um, the m times m, which uh, you notice this map is definitely not surjective unless m happens to be zero. So pullbacks do not preserve exactness. And we we, we, we saw in the previous lecture that pushouts don't preserve exactness either. So, so the two things are just analogous. The next case we're going to do the limits um, are kernels. And taking kernels completely fails to preserve exactness. Um, there are gazillions of examples of this, and this is one of the causes of homological algebra. Um, the simplest example might be just to take naught goes to z, goes to z, goes to z, modulo 2z, goes to 0. You remember this is the counterexample to everything. And we take another copy of it because I'm feeling unimaginative. And we map one to the other. And let's just have multiplication by 2. And let's take the kernels. Well, the kernel of this map is 0. And the kernel of this map is 0. And the kernel of this map is very definitely not 0. So this map is not on 2. And taking kernels does not preserve exactness. Um, so... Um, the final sort of limit we're going to do is the 
let's take the limit to be an inverse limit. What this means is the category is going to look like this. So we take the inverse limit of a0, a1, a2 and so on. And the inverse limit means you take an element in a0 and an element in a1 and an element in a2 and so on. And these all have to be compatible. So the element in a1 must be the image of the element in a2 and so on. Um, now for co-limits, um, we, we, we took direct limits, which are similar except the arrows go the other way. And we showed that for direct limits, um, taking direct limits does preserve um, exactness and more generally you can take the uh, limit over any filtered category and that will preserve exactness. So you might think that the same thing is going to hold for limits that as long as we're taking a limit over some sort of uh, I guess it's, it's not so much directed as co-directed so it's like the definition of a directed set with the arrows reversed. So, so you might guess that taking inverse limits is going to preserve exactness by analogy. And this is completely false. These do not preserve exactness. Um, and this is perhaps a bit surprising because there's a sort of duality between limits and co-limits. Um, a lot of results about limits you can just dualize and get a, the same, a similar result about co-limits and so on. But this, this is one case when duality between limits and co-limits fails. And here's an example. So I'm going to take my sequence to be the standard counter example. And I'm going to take another copy of it. And another copy of it. And I'm going to keep going on like this. And uh, this is multiplication by two. And I need to define what the maps between these are. So, 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 so this kind of goes on forever. And I'm going to take these vertical maps to be multiplication by three rather than by two, for a reason you'll see in a moment. And now let's work out what is the inverse limit of, of each of these columns. Well, there we obviously get zero. Well, here what do we get? Well, we've got to pick an element of z in each of these copies of z such that the element here is three times that, so it must be a multiple of three. And it must be nine times the element there, so it must be a multiple of nine. And similarly, it must be a multiple of 27. So it must be a multiple of every power of three. And that's not possible unless it's zero. So we just get zero here. And for exactly the same reason, we get zero here. But here, the same argument breaks down because we can pick the non-zero element here. And it will be three times the non-zero element here. And also three times the non-zero element. So nine times the non-zero element here and so on. So the direct limit here is z modulo 2z, and this is not on 2. So inverse limits don't preserve exactness, even though direct limits do preserve exactness. Um, well, this is a bit of a problem because we quite often want to know that um, inverse limits of exact sequence are, are exact sequences. Fortunately, um, Mittag Leffler. Um, comes to the rescue. There's a mittag leffler condition on the elements AI. Um, and this is actually a little bit surprising because, um, you know, we're trying to prove that the map from the limit of the BI to the limit of the CI is on to. And the condition says nothing about either the Bs or the Cs. It's a condition on the As that, that, that ensure the map between the Bs and the Cs is on to. And the mittag leffler condition looks a bit weird at first sight, so I'm going to approach it in several steps. Let's do case one. Case one is where every map AI plus one to AI is surjective. Um, and in this case, let's show that it preserves exactness. So we've got these maps, naught goes to AI goes to bi, goes to ci, goes to zero. So what we have to do is we need to pick an element in the inverse limit of the c's. And that means we need to pick an element c0 and c1 and c2 and c3 and so on, which are all compatible. So the image of c1 
should be C0 and the image of C2 should be C1. So these are, um, and we're given um, a sequence like this. And what we want to do is we want to find elements B0 and B1 and B2 and so on, which are also compatible and map onto the Cs. So suppose, for example, that we found an element B0 and B1, and we want to find an element B2. Well, we can find an element B2 mapping onto C2, but alas, the image may not be the, be, actually be B1. And so we need to adjust it. And we adjust it by doing some diagram chasing. And diagram chasing is something you should always do for yourself and not watch anybody else do it. So um, I'm going to do it, but you should then go away and repeat it for yourself. So what we do is we, we start with an element here, B2, and then we go to C2 and C1 and then up to B1, except we don't get to B1, we get, we get something different from B1. But then we can take the difference of these two elements and that will give us an element in this space A1. Well, then we can lift it to A2 because the map from A2 to A1 is surjective. And then we, um, so, so we have an element A1 and A2 here. And then we take A2 here and subtract it from the element B2 we first thought of. Um, and that makes the image of B2 zero here. So, so we kind of do diagram chasing round, um, round like that. Anyway, as I said, you should now go off and do that for yourself. Anyway, if you do that, you see we can find an element B2 and we can keep repeating that. And by mumbling something about the axiom of choice, we can find an element, uh, a sequence of elements B I that are compatible and map onto the C I's. So case one works. Um, next, let's do case two. Um, this case is we have a i plus one to a i is zero. And let's try and do this. So we've got these elements c0, c1, c2, and so on, which are compatible. And we can find elements b0 and b1 and b2 mapping onto all these elements here. But as before, there's no reason to suppose that these elements b i are compatible in general. So what we do is um, we notice that the elements B2 and B1 actually have the same image in B0 and um, because the map from A1 to A0 is zero. So what we can do is, is, is we can replace these elements. Instead of B0, we replace it by the image of B1 and we delete B1 and replace it by the image of B2 and take the image of B3 and so on. Um, and now these elements will still map to C2, C1 and C0 and now they will be compatible um, and you can show they're compatible as I said using the fact that all the maps from the kernel of this map to the kernel of that map is zero. So um, this case works as well. And now um, notice that case two and case one are in some sense opposites of each other. So this is the extreme case when the image of AI plus one is as big as possible. And this is the other extreme case when the image of AI plus one is as small as possible. And you might think we can somehow sort of interpolate between these two extreme cases and show that show that we always get exactness. But but as we saw that fails, that there are examples where the where, where, where the where, where, where the um, sequence of limits is not exact. Um, so we'd better think a bit further. Let's now do case three, um, which is the um, um, image of AJ in AI is zero for I large enough, depending on I. So case two was the case when the image of AI plus one in AI is zero. Now we're just saying the image of some large AI must be zero. Well, this can be reduced to case two by take, um, taking a subsequence. So we pick A naught, we pick AI one such that the image is in, in A naught is zero. 
and then we pick AI2 so that the image in I2 is zero, and we pick AI3 so that the image in I2 is zero, and so on. And if you think about it, replacing our original sequence by a subsequence doesn't actually affect the inverse limit. So, so by taking a subsequence, we reduce to case two. Um, now we come to case four, which is the mitag leffler condition. The mitag leffler condition says that the image of AJ in AI stabilizes. In, in other words, what we, what we do is, is, is we have the image of AI in AI, which is obviously just AI, and this contains the image of AI plus one, which contains the image of AI plus two, and so on. And what we're saying is this must eventually stabilize. We must get to the image of AJ, which must be equal to the image of AJ plus one, which must be equal to all the others. So the two extreme cases, this always works. If the, if the maps all surjective, then all these images are equal to AI. And if the maps are all zero, then, then most of these images are just zero. Um, and we can kind of reduce this case to a combination of cases one and three, because if we take AI, then it has a submodule, which is the stable limit of a j for j large um, and then we can take the quotient of a i by the stable limit and we get an exact sequence and we can do this for um, all the other i's so we get a i plus one and some the same some complicated mess here that i'm not going to bother writing out and the mitag leffler condition implies that these maps are surjective, as you can easily check. And it implies that these maps satisfy case three. Um, and now um, we know that um, if the you, you, using these as the AIs, um, we, we get the condition that exactness is preserved. And using these as the AIs, we, we get exactness is preserved. And by combining the arguments for these two cases, we can see that um, if our AIs are these elements here, that then exactness is preserved. I'm not going to give details of this because it's one of those arguments where if you Here's someone else doing it who don't understand a word they're saying, and you should work it out for yourself just by combining cases one and three that I did earlier. So, um, um, so that's the mitag leffler condition. Before giving a couple of examples of this, I just have a little historical comment. Um, it, it, you might be a bit puzzled about why this is named after mitag leffler. So, mitag leffler was a complex analyst who worked most in the 19th century and didn't work on homological algebra at all because it hadn't been invented in those days. So why is it named after him? Well, um, he proved a theorem called the mittag leffler theorem about the existence of functions with given um, um, poles. And in the course of that, he had a sort of argument um, which Bourbaki's book on topology paraphrases like this. So, so here's Mittag Leffler's theorem about complete Hausdorff uniform spaces. And you see he's got this Mittag Leffler condition saying that the image of something sort of stabilizes in some sense. Um, you see for each alpha there's a large index beta such that something or other happens. Um, so um, Mittag Leffler, of course, didn't actually prove this theorem credited to him because, for a start, um, he died in 1927 and uniform spaces were only invented in 1937, 10 years later. But he did have an argument which is sort of vaguely similar to this, so it's fair to credit him with that. Um, and um, the analogous theorem for modules rather than complete Hausdorff uniform spaces is still named after him. So he didn't actually prove anything about modules, but he did prove a theorem which had some sort of condition not totally unlike this condition.
Anyway, I'll just finish off by giving a couple of examples of things that do and don't satisfy the Mittag-Leffler condition. So the first example is something that does not satisfy the Mittag-Leffler condition. Um, let me go back down. So this is the sequence Z goes to Z goes to Z goes to Z and so on, where this is multiplication by three. So this is the example we had before. It's A0, A1, A2 and so on, as something that didn't preserve exactness. And you can see the, 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 the limit of the A1 in here is 3Z and the limit of A2 is 9Z and the limit of A3 is 27Z and so on. So it's not stabilizing. It just keeps on getting smaller and smaller. And you might say it sort of tends to a limit Z. So, well, tending to a limit isn't good enough. It actually has to has to stabilize. So this fails the Mittag-Leffler condition. And as we saw in the example earlier, um, if the AIs are, are given like this, then exactness isn't necessarily preserved. So for the next example, let's just take the AI to be finite. Well, in this case, the Mittag-Leffler condition is satisfied. Um, that's because um, if we take AI that contains the image of AI plus one, which contains the image of AI plus two, and this must stabilize because we've got a sequence of decreasing subsets of a finite set. And that can't go on decreasing forever, so this stabilizes as AI is finite. So that means if we've got a sequence of modules um, with AI finite, then um, the limit of the BI maps onto the limit of the CI. Um, if you try and prove directly that this limit maps onto the limit just using the fact that a, the AI is finite, you'll actually find, you'll probably find it's actually quite difficult. So this roundabout proof using mittag leffler does seem to be the best way to do it. Okay, that's all about limits and co-limits.